welcome to my channel. Today is Dr. Saru. Dr. Saru again. It's another beautiful Friday. My daughter insisted on doing the intro for me today. That is why you heard her voice at the beginning of the video. Uh, so after the commercial break or whatever break we'd want to call that of uh, the other videos I was doing about my personal life, we go back to our tutorials or our lectures. And today we're going to be talking about meconium aspiration syndrome so get your notebooks out and let's get started so that we can learn something new and for those who's not sub who've not subscribed yet sorry please do so like uh, comment if you have any questions and please be sure to share it with your friends so that they can also learn too thank you First of uh, definition of terms, meconium is the first intestinal discharge from newborns or of newborns. It is normally composed of intestinal secretions. Uh, the intestinal secretions are such as um, bile, mucus, um, and then there's lanugo, of course, and the mucus. I already mentioned about it. And uh, part of the intestinal secretions also include mucosal cells. Aspiration can occur before or during labor. The gestation period or the gestation age of the pregnancy should be at least above 34 weeks. Before I go to the pathophysiology of uh, meconium aspiration syndrome, I'd like to mention a few of the causes uh, that may lead to passage of meconium in utero. Uh, number one placental insufficiency of any cause or reason but i'll not talk about placental insufficiency today but uh, maybe a topic for another day maternal hypertension which also uh, contributes to placental insufficiency in some way can be a cause of um, the meconium um, passage of meconium in utero preeclampsia oligohydromnius and uh, maternal uh, drug abuse especially tobacco so pathophysiology I've tried to be as elaborate as possible I actually drew this myself so that I can uh, try to help you guys understand uh, how it happens so first there must be fetal hypoxic stress huh? fetal hypoxia is the one that uh, is the initial cause of um, the neural stimulation of the maturing gut yeah so when there's neural stimulation uh, of the maturing gut it normally causes um in 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 a shorter way i'll just say this vagal stimulation and then that leads to peristalsis and relaxation of the rectal sphincter and definitely meconium is going to be passed and you see once uh, meconium ha ha, I mean, has been passed, we should understand that meconium and the surrounding of the baby inside is normally sterile. But then it uh, lowers the antibacterial um, activity and plus also meconium to the skin normally causes um, uh, a risk of um, uh, erythema toxicum sometimes, yeah, increases the risk of that. Uh, back in the days when I was... Um, uh, in campus it was a common viva question effects on respiratory system effects of mass on respiratory system it's a commonly asked viva question i don't know about now but in our days that used to be a commonly asked question so there are four effects four main effects on the respiratory system um secondary to mass yeah the first one which is obvious respiratory obstruction or airway obstruction it can either be complete obstruction or it can be partial obstruction with complete obstruction it results into atelectasis in partial uh, 
uh, obstruction, sorry, this air trapping, hyperdistension or alveoli, and sometimes may rupture and cause pneumothorax. The second thing is surfactant dysfunction. Uh, meconium has been shown to deactivate surfactant um, and also inhibit surfactant synthesis, results in diffuse uh, atelectasis. The third thing is chemical pneumonitis. Yeah? Um, I'll not go into deep details about it, but it has to do with the enzyme and bile salts and all the free fatty acids that are found in the meconium that initiates the, the, that process. Yeah? Uh, the fourth is persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. Yes, it can be secondary to, cro I mean, secondary to chronic in utero stress uh, and the thickening of the pulmonary vessels. It worsens actually this condition. The persistent pulmonary hypertension worsens in hypoxemic states of which this baby is already in. Yeah. Epidemiology. Um, 8 to 25 percent of all buds with gestational age of more than 34 weeks, it's found in 8 to 25 percent of all buds. Yeah, uh, admission it's um, 1.8, I mean, 1.8 percent of the term neonates, um, equal female and male buds or babies or neonates can get mass and um. The age of occurrence is mainly for, more for babies who are term or post term babies happen to, I mean, a preterm, it's very unlikely you find them having mass. But for term babies and post term babies, you might actually definitely get it if there was any fetal distress. Causes of uh, meconium aspiration syndrome, it's quite repetitive. We have to know, or rather you should know, Causes of fetal hypoxia or, yes, fetal distress secondary to hypoxia, um, which is quite repetitive from what I already told you. Uh, placenta insufficiency, there's so many reasons for placenta insufficiency, fetal hypoxia, preeclampsia, oligohydromnias, and the fifth one, maternal hypertension. You can also remember the other one, uh, maternal drug uh, use especially tobacco. So those are some of the causes of mass or the most commonly occurring causes of mass. So on examination, the baby will definitely be cyanosed. Okay, you can find cyanosis. They'll be grunting. Uh, the other thing, uh, the baby might be tachypnic. Um, then the telltale signs, the yellow and green staining of the fingernails, cord or skin, um, or even around the, the nasal area, yeah? Uh, and you might find ronchi on auscultation. Differential diagnosis of mass, number one, aspiration syndrome, two, uh, congenital uh, diaphragmatic hernia, uh, three, pneumonia, four, sepsis, uh, five, pulmonary hypertension. Uh, I actually found more than this for differential diagnosis, but I felt like I give you a test or I give you a task or an exercise to do. I'd like for you guys to comment some of the other, some of the other differential diagnosis down on the comments below so that we can get interactive and I I know that you guys are actually studying something it's not like I'm giving you everything yes yeah, so that's it for investigations you have the lab works and you have the imaging so for lab works you need your CBC uh, because if there's been chronic hypoxia, things you can see in your CBC, chronic, uh, I mean, for chronic hypoxia, you can see polycythemia. Um, also, it affects uh, your electrolyte balance. There's, there, there's normally in, uh, some imbalance in your electrolyte. So serum, electrolyte, electrolyte sorry, uh, your UEC is very important. Acid-based uh, uh, status is also very important because you see, they are also susceptible to 
AKI uh, for neonates who had or you suspect to be having mass. Uh, for imaging, there's chest x-ray, of course, uh, to check if there's been lung collapse or any of those things. And as much as maybe for from your examination, you'll find that out already. But it's also good for for you to confirm the air trapment uh, and what not. Yeah? Uh, the brain imaging, as I said, hypoxia is the main thing that the main culprit that leads to mass and then all those things happening. So um, hypoxia can also uh, damage the brain in one or another. So it's good if you can do either cranial ultrasound, if that is what is available at your facility. Uh, if you can, a CT scan, MRI, whichever you, you would have preferred or with your in con uh, collaboration with your consultant, whatever you thought is good for the baby at that particular time. Uh, another imaging thing or other technique uh, ECG yeah? uh, to determine pulmonary hypertension as I already told you it can cause that and also to differentiate could it be mass really or maybe transposition of great arteries because it also happens uh, to be a differential diagnosis I already gave you one you guys give me others differential diagnosis down in the comment below please so for treatment, I'll do a whole segment because I felt I needed to give you to break it down properly and not to compress everything in one video. But if possible, if we can prevent mass from happening, I always believe in prevention is better than cure. That's the kind of doctor I am. So if you've not subscribed yet, you guys, please do so down below. Um, I think on the left, on the left or right, I'm not sure, down below. Yeah. Um, like share this video with your colleagues and uh, your friends and yeah comment and tell me what you should you think I should do next week or how I can better this channel for your for your consumption thank you love and love dr. Saru